we lived on the railroad track, actually. Sure. And I remember my father getting up at five in the morning and going, <laughs> walking across the street in his pajamas and a robe. And George Bolet, the pian great pianist, yes. got off the train. And my dad said, Mr. Bolet? He said, yes. Then took his suitcase and took him into the house and made breakfast. <laughs> he stayed with us. <laughs> Just great, great player. We reminisced about it at, at Aspen one summer when I saw him. To see those, I had no idea how great they were, you know. Who else That's did that in your house? Eugene List and his wife, Carol Glenn. Her big thing was she owned the Hope Diamond and she wore the Hope Diamond and took it with her and that was, that was her big deal. Yeah. Better she had known the Glauber Diamond. You know the Glauber Diamond? Do you know that story? Yeah, this woman has Glauber Diamond. She says, the Glauber diamond, it's a, it's a great diamond. She said, you know, the only problem is there's a curse that goes with it. She said, what is it? She said, Mr. Glauber. <laughs> I love that old story, it's great. <laughs> great. <laughs>
When I graduated from high school, I had a trio called the El Shuko Trio, and we did a nine-month tour of the United States. The day that I arrived back in New York City, I came down with encephalitis. I was hospitalized for almost nine months in and out, and it left me blind in one eye. And I thought, this is a terrible thing for a musician to not be able to sight read. But I was determined to be a violinist, a successful violinist, and a chamber music player. Whether trios or quartets, and I decided to devote four hours a day to memorizing scores, which I did four hours a day. And I said, that's, <laughs> talk about dedication. How many scores do you know? He said, well, over 800, all the parts. And this came true because at one class recital at Manas, we did Mendelssohn Octet, and the fourth violin called in from Long Island the night of the concert to the concert hall, and he said, I have a terrible flu and there's no way I'm going to get in and play the concert, so I guess you'll have to cancel the Mendelssohn Quartet, Octet. So Kroll was in the audience, and I went into the audience, and I said, Mr. Kroll, we, we have to cancel the Octet. And he said, do you have the music? And I said, I said, no, I don't have the music, but it, he has it in Long Island. And Kroll said, let me go get my violinist in my studio. And he went and got the Strat, and he played the fourth violin part from memory, and it was perfect. Every one of my colleagues that I met that studied at Tanglewood, uh, for instance, James Dunham and, and Norman Fisher and all these, they all studied chamber music with Kroll for, for 30 years he taught there, and not one of them ever saw him use a score. Wow. It's, it's, it's amazing, but it was all there. So there was one of those marvelous multi-movement Corelli sonatas. So that there's seven movements, and there was one section in one of the movements that ended three times. It came to a cadence, then continued in another cadence, and then continued in another cadence, and Sergio could not find the own limitations that he liked. We worked for 20 minutes, minutes on those damn three measures, over and over and over, until he finally wasn't satisfied. And at one point, the harpsichordist, Lionel, said, Sergio, why don't you try this? And I said, oh, this is going to be very interesting. The professor from Juilliard and Curtis is going to teach Sergio Luca, the world's great authority on ornamentation. And I looked at Sergio and his eyes got very dark. And he said, and suddenly a little twinkle appeared and he said, well, Lionel, you know, using someone else's ornamentation, using someone else's ornaments is like wearing someone else's underpants. And there was a long pause that he said, it's possible but not the recommended. <laughs> you can see him do that, can't you? you can see yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh. Uh, we were talking today about what what is a romantic, and it's 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 an approach to music that has room for the individual. Really, if you are a culture musician, you've done your homework. You've looked at the originals, how they played it, hopefully early recordings, modern recordings, late recordings, and make a mix that you feel you want to impart to an audience the way you want to impart it. I know I never dictated to my students how they should sound, but I gave them lots of possibilities. And possibilities make the world round. So I think all of my students do little things, Zachary or Adam and you, they all uh, do little things with the music that I said, oh, they invented that one. They, it makes me so proud as a teacher, you know, because I see the things that you accomplish, and I know I started it, but I sure didn't finish it. <laughs> you never know when a teacher's uh, influence ends, because it goes on from you to a student, to another student, to another student. I have students that have come to Rice that have studied with students of my students already. It's amazing. It's incredible. And they're better. Each one of them is better. <laughs>